I'm going to look at medieval seal matrices bearing the names of women using data exclusively from the Portable Antiquity Scheme. So I'm going to have to start, I'm afraid, with yet more comments about our data set. Uh, Laura has done a fantastic job um, in telling you about uh, our whole range of seal matrices, medieval and post-medieval. Um, but I'm going to, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to hit you with some more stuff about our data. Oh, and at this point, I should also say that I have flipped most, if not all, of my pictures in Photoshop. So you'll see a mirror image of the matrix which obviously will make the inscriptions easier to read and I've generally tried to add our record numbers which should let you find the record. Okay so I'll start off with this most archaeology is rubbish so it's deliberately discarded things that aren't wanted anymore like broken pottery and food waste and so on but portable antiquities scheme items are different because they're mainly found by metal detectorists and because they are made from metal, they are unlikely to be rubbish because metal objects can obviously be melted down and made into something else when they're no longer wanted. Um, now, uh, if our objects are mostly accidental losses, this of course introduces some biases. Um, objects are more vulnerable to accidental loss if they're small and if they're routinely carried around rather than kept in a safe place. Um, losses can obviously be quickly refound if you lose something at home or, or near to home or in a crowded place, you can find it again. So most of our objects tend to be from lonely places in the countryside. And lastly, rubbish is generally of low worth, but accidental losses can include things of, of very high worth, very valuable items. Then recovery through metal detecting brings an extra set of biases. And here we see a picture of a conventional archeological excavation, making the point that it concentrates on small areas of intensively occupied settlement. Most finds are discarded rubbish. Not many seal matrices are found in excavations. In contrast, metal detectorists look at large rural areas They've got machines designed to home in on metal, so they find more of these elusive accidental losses that are thinly scattered uh, across large areas of landscape. And the third thing that I have to admit about our database is that it's not designed for seal matrices. It's got to accommodate everything, every kind and date of object. It doesn't have the kind of seal specific fields that sigillographers might like. Um, that's why we tend to recommend that you download our data, perhaps into an Excel spreadsheet and recode it with extra detail. And of course, equally, our recorders have to cope with everything from flint hand axes to musket balls. So the quality of our records can vary. And our recorders can use whatever words they like to describe a seal matrix. And too much variety, of course, makes it difficult to find what you're looking for. And then, as uh, Laura said, the objects we record are lent to us for recording. Most are returned to their finders. They're not collected for posterity in museums. Uh, they can't be consulted again and again as questions change. But on the plus side, we aim to replace the object with a record. So we add detail that some other databases lack. So, for example, nearly 90% of our records of medieval seal matrices have images. And Really, we are a fantastic resource for medieval seals, as I'm sure everybody would agree. One astonishing statistic is just how many there are. Seal matrices are the seventh most common medieval metal object. So after coins, which are the commonest, and then strap fittings like buckles, mounts and strap ends, and, when, and metal cooking vessels, the next thing down is seal matrices. So we've got nearly three in every hundred of our medieval finds being seal matrices. So that's the data set, the kind of large scale data set. Now, how does the data set for women's matrices compare? I'm sorry about this horrible slide full of, full of numbers, but uh, what it really tells you is that John Cherry first began looking at this. Uh, he um, looked at uh, Suffolk seal matrices in 2007, and he counted up about 20% of matrices with identifiable names were those of women. Then in the same year in Norfolk, there was a study that found a similar proportion. And then uh, I had a count up in 2013 of all the PAS seal matrices with readable names and found a slightly higher number, 23%, but it's roughly one in five. But that of course is a bare minimum because many names have female and marial variants like John and Joan or Philip and Philippa, or these ones, Julian or Juliana. 
Now, on the seals, of course, the names can be abbreviated, so they lose those endings which distinguish male from female. And matrices like these ones on the slide, they're perhaps individually more likely to have belonged to a man. So we often assume that a specific individual seal, matri seal matrix belongs to a man, unless there's a specifically female ending. But presumably, at least a few, perhaps around 20% of these gender neutral matrices belong to women. So obviously we're going to be underestimating rather than overestimating the number of women who had seals. Now, I would like to know whether uh, whether this proportion of about 20% is also found among the aristocracy. I wonder if higher up the social scale, the discrepancy between the wealth that a man controls and the wealth of a woman might be greater. Lower down, of course, nobody has that much. Perhaps men and women use their seals more equally. Um, or possibly the view that there are fewer women seals the higher you go up in the social hierarchy simply comes from our data set and it's particular low status bias. Certainly we record very few seal matrices like this one on the slide. But of course, if higher status women aren't sealing so much, then the documentary record, the archival record, which tends to preserve higher status, more, more important documents, that might have an even greater bias against women seals compared to the archeological record. Now, the sample of women's seal matrices that I've used for this talk, uh, the, the, the number in total is 446. Um, and, uh, and so I'll go on to tell you what they're like. I'll start off with the shape. As you would expect, they're more likely to be pointed oval than circular. So over two thirds of them are pointed oval, just over a quarter are circular, and there's a few other shapes. Now, to compare the men's matrices, um, I took a kind of roughly the same size sample of men's. Um, and in, in that sample, there are far fewer pointed oval matrices, but still nearly half of men's seals are pointed oval. So that shape per se doesn't denote femininity. And then you can see that just over half of the men's um, matrices are circular. Men are also more likely to have a tall conical handled matrix than women, but any kind of named conical matrix is relatively rare. Conical matrices tend to go along with the anonymous seals of the 14th century. Looking at uh, material, men, uh, women's seals are overwhelmingly of lead. Um, for men's seals, again, there's a predominance of lead, but it isn't so overwhelming. Um, by the way, Robin Laura's higher rate of copper alloy is because they include all of the seals, you know, including the anonymous ones, which are much more likely to be made from copper alloy. And obviously, I'm only looking at the personal ones. Then looking at decoration on the reverse, uh, quite a lot of women's seal matrices have this re relief decoration cast onto the reverse. Um, it appears on both the circular and the pointed oval ones, but only on those made from lead. And at first you think, well, there looks like there's much less cast relief decoration uh, among men's matrices, but that's also because there's much less lead. When you look just at men's lead matrices, the proportion with relief decoration is pretty close to that of women. So again, that's not a female uh, signifier. There's many different designs. On this slide, you can see chevrons and perhaps a double barred cross and what might be clasped hands below. Uh, but the commonest design um, is the fleur-de-lis, which you might think is used as a symbol of the Virgin Mary, so maybe femininity in general, except that it also turns up on men's seals. And of course, uh, the fleur-de-lis is also found on the other side of the matrix as a central motif. It's the commonest motif on women's seals. It makes up about a third of all central motifs on women's seals, but about a fifth of men's seals have it too. So here we have two women on the left and two men on the right. Uh, here are the figures. Uh, the most common motif for women is the fleur-de-lis and the second most common is radial motifs. So together, those two comprise over half of all matrices. For men, it's much the same. Um, their commonest is the radial, fleur-de-lis comes second. So together, those comprise nearly half of all men's matrices. Uh, for women, there are also a lot of quatrefoils. Possibly that could be seen as a subset of radials, twice as many as are found with men. 
um, and all other motifs are found on 5% of women's matrices or fewer. For men, there are a lot of birds. Again, twice as many as are found with the opposite sex. And again, all other motifs are found on 5% of men's matrices or fewer. So are there any motifs that reliably distinguish women? Well, our stereotypical central motif for a woman seal is the standing female figure, but we've just got 10 of those recorded on the PAS database, mostly on copper alloy matrices. Now, some are quite grand, as uh, two here with shields of arms, or Beatrice at the top right, who's got a hawk with jesses, but others are less grand. Uh, at the bottom, we have a lead matrix, um, and then the one at the top right, that's really got rather duff workmanship. I, I, I do like Catherine of Stanling. She's rather charmingly holding a squirrel rather than a hawk, um, which I, I feel is a bit less grand. Um, but so th these are women with our standing figures, but we also have some very similar standing figures on men's seals um, and on monks or cleric seals with some examples here. The women's seals also have a few motifs of the devotional type, which show figures praying to a saint. This slide, though, pretty much shows you all of them. On the left, uh, we've got a figure kneeling within the main field, praying to a standing figure in a long dress who's holding a wreath of flowers. Um, Elizabeth uh, New has found a, a, a large number like this among London seals, but this one is from Warwickshire. Um, and note that it is one of the rare women's conical matrices. The two on the right are more conventional. We've got the Virgin Mary and the Christ child with a praying figure below uh, within an architectural frame. And we've also, I really like these, we've got a couple of figures apparently reading books. So I've shown you quite a few fairly complex designs. Um, these really are the exceptions. Women's seals in general have, have simpler designs, more formulaic designs. Um, it does seem from our material that women's seals are perhaps more restricted than men's in what they can show. And it is possible to glimpse a few real differences between the motifs on men's and women's seals. Um, to, to kind of put it simply, men can have everything a woman can have, and they can also have some extras on top. So several motifs don't appear in the sample of women's matrices at all, but are found among, among the men. And the commonest is the merchant's mark, but there are also ships, fish, stags' heads, dragons or wyverns, and hunting scenes. Uh, not only that, but in these, in these two samples of men and women that are similarly sized, the men have 20 times the number of lions with nice fluffy tails, uh, four times the number of shields of arms, three times the number of annuals days, and double the number of pelicans and squirrels. So there do seem to be some motifs that are more appropriate for men than for women, and these are perhaps unsurprisingly headed by merchants' marks, lions, and heraldry. But in common with anybody else who's ever looked at, uh, at, at women's seal, and seal uh, matrices and impressions, I haven't been able to find any central motif that's only appropriate for a woman and isn't found with plenty of men. The only exception is these two rather lovely things, both women, uh, both found in Sussex, about 12 miles apart. And I think of these as being exceptionally literate. The engraver has spurned the merely pictorial uh, in favour of words. Um, and it's a real pity that the one on the left doesn't clearly say Ave Maria, but it does seem to be what it's driving at. Um, the other one is a place name. It's New Timber or Nye Timber. Annoyingly, both of those are places that occur in, in Sussex, meaning a new building. Oh, and by the way, the, um, the image with the black background you'll occasionally see on PAS records, it's been put into negative, what Photoshop calls inverted, and that can make some difficult images easier to read. So that's, that's a, handy, a handy thing to know about. Now, these two, there's nothing to compare with these among our men's seals. And of course, they, are, they have been found very close together and so might suggest that there are regional variations in the motifs chosen. But as yet, I haven't done any work on this either. It, it's, a, it's a wide open field for everybody to get involved with. Right, I now want to turn to the names on women's seal matrices. Um, out of the uh, uh, over 400 are fairly well readable and there are 79 different first names. The top five, Alice, Agnes, Margaret or Marjorie, Matilda and Emma, 
they were used on half the matrices. And this, interestingly, mirrors David Postle's work on the name of, names of 90 noble women who were alive in 1185. Half of his women used exactly the same set of first names. He had many more Matildas and slightly fewer of all the other names, um, <clears throat> but otherwise, it's the same set. So although women's matrices on the PAS database look largely low status, the names are very similar to those of noble women a generation or two before. So those are the commonest names. Uh, there's also an interesting range of names. We've got some, several of the exotic names that are typical of the 13th century. Over half the women in the sample have names that only crop up once or twice in the data set. Um, and there seems to have been more variation among the women's names than among the men's. Moving on to by names. Um, now I find these much more interesting than first names. They give the seal owner a context of descent or marital status or location or occupation and so on. Because they're more variable than the first names, they can be more difficult to read and also they can not always be reliably classified because it's possible for them to have several meanings. But there are over 350 classifiable by names in the sample. And the largest category is surnames of relationship. As you can see from this slide that patronymics are the commonest with over a third of classifiable by names being patronymics. I've written over a third, but I can see it's 31%. And I don't think that's the same, but um, let's say it's nearly a third. Um, matronymics, where the mother's named, are far rarer, but this is probably again an underestimate. We may fail to recognise these matronymics because the names are abbreviated, so again the masculine or feminine endings are lost. Uh, but in my sample of men's seals there seem to be even fewer matronymics. There's just nine men's seals with the mother's name mentioned. Here are a couple of wives. We've got 35 matrices which describe the seal holder as a wife and 11 which describe her as a widow. The wives are mainly described as X wife of Y. In one case, um, Juliana, as we see here, the person simply described as wife. We don't know of whom. In a third of examples, the husband is also given a by name, but a wife is never given her own additional by name. Now, we one wonders what the precise date of these matrices might be. It seems that the legal status of married women declined through the 13th century to the point where towards the end of the century they could apparently not make their own contracts. Um, I've got one, a couple of widows as well, similar in design, most simply saying seal of X, widow of Y. Again, a substantial minority give the husband's by name. Now, Susan Johns has pointed out that attached documents can show a different marital status at the time of sealing to, to the actual seal. And it may be that the seal, in fact, reflects the importance of one particular relationship in the woman's life, even if that's a former husband rather than the current one. And by the way, in case you're wondering, the spousal relationship is never mentioned among the men. Uh, I don't think any seal matrix with X husband of Y uh, has has ever been uh, recorded and there certainly isn't one among PAS seals, more's a pity. The next biggest category of place names, uh, sorry, of by names is place names. We've got 65 specific place names and 17 kind of more generic places like uh, Mabel Holloway here. Um, then come nicknames like my own name, Geek, um, and occupation names. And here are some of the occupation names. I've divided them into what you might call the conventional feminine occupations on the right and the more improbable occupations on the left. Um, but of course, women actually did do most jobs, including such macho pursuits as smithing and stone breaking and thatching, both before and after marriage. But Henrietta Lizer has pointed out that the work was usually casual rather than permanent and women weren't as defined by their employment as men. But still, we, we have a, a great range. Are these personal by names or are they inherited family names? Are they what we would understand as surnames? I will leave that question hanging and I will move on to the double sided matrices. We've got 38 of these on the PAS database, six named to men, four named to women, and in 11 cases, they're man and woman. Of the 11 man and woman matrices, 
on only two are the people described in terms of their relationship to other to each other and both are husband and wife um, now on this slide we've got two uh, kind of random examples these couples have got similar central motifs but their by names are different they may have been married to each other but their seals don't say this in the four cases where both the seals are of women, two pairs, these two, seem clearly related. Uh, one pair shares the same father's name, same patronymic. Another pair shares the same nickname by name. But in most cases of man and woman seals, like these ones, the woman's got her own by name and there's no mention of a relationship to the man on the other side of the seal. Um, and these are the kind of extreme ones. Um, the relationship between the two people on the seal matrix is entirely opaque, including this pair of men at the bottom with different patronymics. Right, I'm going to leave you with my last slide, which is Christina and Norman Shepherd. Uh, I have always thought they're a couple who sound more 1970s and 1270s, um, while I go through a couple of kind of conclusions. What we've seen is that uh, women's matrices from the PAS database tend to be commonplace and low status objects. They differ from men's matrices in that more are flat and made from lead and slightly more are pointed oval. But other aspects don't seem to distinguish women's seals. Decorative aspects aren't hugely different. So that suggests that even in the highly gendered medieval world, gender doesn't need to be expressed on seal matrices. Perhaps the difference in material and shape is due to a difference in the status of these women or in the date of the matrices or perhaps both. Um, but perhaps those two things are more common than gender. In terms of date, flat seal matrices tend to be earlier, we think, being joined by conical matrices in the 14th century. We've got very few conical matrices with women's names. Might it be possible that a decline in the status of married women caused a decline in the need for seal usage by these women? Or might women have continued to seal, but might they have started to hide their gender behind anonymous seals earlier than men did? In terms of social status, lead is obviously cheaper than copper alloy. Lead matrices tend to be less well made, and most of our women's seals look cheap and utilitarian. Now, two questions arise from this. Firstly, why do poor or middling women seem to have greater access to sealing than rich women? And secondly, if seal matrices are used to advertise aspects of identity, why aren't they used as a focus for investment? Why aren't they, be, they being used to aspire to a higher status? Now, one possibility that's been mentioned by Laura and has been suggested by both John Cherry and Elizabeth New, and I find very, um, very interesting, is that low status seal matrices might have been commissioned for a specific act of sealing. And that might be particularly true of those using double sided matrices. They could be together for the sealing of just a single document. Uh, or it might also be appropriate for widows whose status might be temporary. And this might go some way towards explaining that huge number of low status matrices. They could be almost disposable in a way that frequently used aristocratic or official seals weren't. So hitherto, most work on women's seals has looked at aristocratic seals or seals which survive on documents. And it's drawn conclusions about seals as a language of power, of authority, of identity. If we look at this brief flowering of low status women's matrices, we get quite another picture, cheap, utilitarian, almost disposable items. And I think the story they tell us is different, but it's no less worth hearing. Thank you. And I will now attempt to stop sharing my screen and hope it goes better than the start. Thank you very much indeed, Helen. Again, another absolutely fascinating and very exciting um, paper. Uh, we've got a couple of questions. You've sort of half answered Laura's um, question comments, but with the double side matrices, could it be for a particular occasion? But she also asks, could we be seeing reuse? That is a very interesting question. There is one that I know I've I've I kind of have discounted because it seemed like it wasn't a proper double sided matrix. It's a normal matrix on one side and then someone's had a go at scratching their name on the other side. Laurie, you'll probably be able to find it. That is, is a, is a um, that's a particularly interesting one that deserves more um, a, a thorough look at. Thank you. 
Um, from Philip Saunders, are lead seals less likely to be found by metal detectorists, so therefore skewing the data in favour of men? I don't think so, no. I think, I think they're just as easy to recognise as something important. Uh, they're also often much easier to read, so I, I don't think that's the case, no. Well, that, that, is, that is interesting. Um, an anonymous question. For, um, have any of the found seals been connected with known documents? No, that is the Holy Grail. Um, we, we've, we've come close to it with Chris Whittick in Sussex, working very closely with our FLO. He's been checking documents, um, but, uh, but, but no, as far as I know, Laura might know better, but as far as I know, nothing yet, no. Um, I would also say no, although I did manage to get a document that named the person who almost certainly owned the seal, but the seal on that document was different, <laughs> annoyingly. But um, that was the closest. She had an unusual name. It was an unusual place. And we had a husband's name. But yes, yeah, so that's the closest I've got. Yeah, and I, I think your point about accidental loss is very important when we're when this particular part of the discussion about connecting surviving matrices with surviving impressions. Yes, yes, I, I do think that that is the, the real great strength of our data, that it is accidental loss. Yep. Um, I think that's it. I think Laura has actually answered several of the questions uh, in chat. So if anyone wants to look there, um, I will restrain myself because I have so many things I want to ask you. I'll delay, I'll delay matters. But I'd like to thank you very much again for that. A absolutely fascinating so much potential there for so many more uh, things to follow up um, and there we 